Hosanna, 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 Hosanna. Hey, JC, JC, won't you smile at me? Hosanna, Hosanna, hey, superstar. Tell the rabble to be quiet, we anticipate a riot, this common crowd is much too loud. Tell the mob who sing your song that they are fools and they are wrong, they are a curse, they should disperse. All right. We did My it. <laughs> God, that's the sound of science. That's the sound <laughs> the of science. Sounds of science. Um, all right, I'm also going to. That's right. I'm lowering my uh, input sensitivity on the thing we're recording this in because your Caiaphas voice was so low and bassy and hardcore that uh, it cut out some of your notes. No. Should we do it <laughs> again? <you're... laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm saying you broke the machine with your power. Oh, by the way, question for you guys. Can we do editing of this audio or this just goes in completely unedited? Who the fuck is that? No, we can't. So you're in the show now, Steve. All right, well, let's do it then. Um, let's do it. We're in. I'm Michael Swaim. That's Griffin Rowell. We're best pals. We talk about science and we're very excited today to be sitting down with Steve Casey virtually. Welcome, Steve. Say hey. hey. Thank you, guys. Nice to be here. Thank you. Um, Steve actually initially reached out through our Patreon, patreon.com slash smallbeans, and just like shared something interesting because he was like, you're interested in science. Here's something that I did science-wise. And of course, because I'm a thirsty content monster, I said, well, let's hop on the old Discord and chat about it so uh, that I can get that sweet, sweet patron money. That's what it's all about. Um, no, we're here to unpack that idea, learn about it. I found it so interesting. I was just like, I got to know more. Um, and I'm too dumb to understand some of the aspects of the paper. So I'd like you to walk me through it personally, <laughs> which is a tremendous privilege I have as a science podcaster. Uh, if you understand the format of the show, you know that I endeavor to bring like a layman's enthusiasm to it. I hope Griffin will ask some more incisive things than I'm able to ask because he worked, has worked and would you say you continue to work in the sciences? Not really. Uh, I work in AI now. Well, they, they, that's science, baby. You can't spell science without AI? No, no, yeah, you can. Um, all right, so let's dive into it. Um, Steve, I, I, short of just reading the abstract at the beginning of the paper you sent us, uh, I'd rather ha hear it in your own words. Could you briefly describe like elevator pitch for just the idea you're bringing to the table? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I could also do a brief intro of myself if that would work for you guys. Yeah. I mean, I am, uh, I'm here only as myself, not as a representative of the U S government, but, uh, my name is Stephen Casey. I work at the NASA Langley research center in Hampton, Virginia. And, um, I do research at the intersection of machine learning and artificial intelligence with the physical sciences and chemistry and materials design and things like that. Um, that was very interesting and the kind of stuff a good host would ask. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> oh, of course. Um, so essentially, I was doing research into complex systems. And I was looking into problems related to things like, you know, climate change and inequality and things related to that that affect a lot of people. And from a very high level standpoint, just from a, you know, 10,000 foot, you know, view. Mm hmm here's sort of the single sentence description of what I'm going to talk about is from a mathematical standpoint, if I were to give you a system that's configured in the same way that the economy is configured and I didn't tell you anything else about it, I just gave you the underlying mathematical framework, you would be able to predict that this kind of system would lead to a condition of runaway energy expenditure. And sure enough, when we look at the actual economy, we do see a system that's incentivized to output increasing amounts of energy, despite the negative effects that this has on the climate and the well-being of many individuals and things like that. So if we look at it 
from a game theory point of view or a control theory point of view, the reason for that misconfiguration is fundamentally an incorrect configuration of the reward function, which is more or less the role of currency. That's more or less the function that money performs in the economy. And if the fitness of a system, in general, a complex system, being a system that exhibits behavior across a range of length scales and time scales, is correlated to its information entropy content, then if we adjust the value of money to be correlated to information entropy, then it should be possible to calibrate the system correctly so that it's possible to exist in a state of energy balance with the environment while also optimizing the well-being of the participants in the system. That's sort of the, the high-level point of view. If you, that were an elevator pitch that I'm used to, like for a movie that you literally have to make in an elevator with an executive, mm -hmm. way too long for those purposes. But I'm going to do my job now and, and barely understand the topic, but like spit it out in a way that I think is what you're saying. And you correct me if I'm wrong. Sure. Um, uh, and it, it strikes me as something that I've always, I've carried with me from a young age that I think is a real key to success in life, or at least not, uh, and winding up in a direction where you go, wait, what was I doing? I wasted X amount of time and I forgot the thread, um, which I think a lot of us do at various points in our life, uh, is what is your goal? You got to constantly define your goal. And uh, a lot of us dropped into a system or a flow that's already ongoing, i.e. the entire history of the human race and now capitalism in America specifically or globally, you know, capitalist forces. Uh, you are dropped into a system and you sort of implicitly just absorb the goals of your acculturation like um dang i gotta start a business why because i gotta get money uh and then there's a series of intermediary steps i think will lead me to that outcome but something i think few of us do enough is go is what i want really money or like the big one for me is actually happiness i i always think I got to be maximum happy, maximum amount of time to make my life matter or whatever. And you got to go back to basics and think, wait, what is the goal? And I, I feel like your paper is suggesting uh, <laughs> that um, we've forgotten. I, an interesting thing I took from the paper was that, uh, and I don't even understand exactly how nodes and edges work, but just from context, what I feel like I'm picking up is you talk about how if, if this were, you know, modeled the nodes would represent different things and we've made all the edges that we've set them all to zero it's like we've turned on a cheat on the game acting like there won't be consequences later or we have not ever included mathematically or systemically the goal of oh is the goal to produce maximum money as fast as possible until everyone chokes to death no no reasonable human being would actually say that's the goal if they were asked like no one wants that outcome the goal is even if you're super pro-capitalist, right? The goal in theory is for there to be a free hand of the market and some people have more and some people have less and there's this game of thrones is played or whatever you believe about internally capitalism, but it should be able to function forever or you want it to function as long as possible without carbon monoxide poisoning killing everyone. Like you want the engine to run and last. And I think even your most diehard capitalists would agree that they want the thing to last and not everyone to die because then they lose their ability to like have that money and enjoy those things that that money buys. Uh, Griffin, what's your take on this? Was that at all dancing around what he's saying? Um, yeah. So I guess just from taking a step back of what the paper saying, maybe explain it a little bit more in maybe layman's terms is, uh, if the economy is, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of analogs in this paper, uh, both economic and thermodynamic. So it's kind of, kind of the idea that the economy is an engine and uh, the amount of energy that it's going to be using in order to run the machine, whatever, the car of the earth with humanity on it is greater than what the fuel source can sustain, um, both from a an actual poten potentially an actual fuel uh, standpoint, and then also just the um, the ecology of the Earth in relation to humanity. 
as like and an so analogy for funeral. I, yeah. I, I don't know, uh, Michael, we didn't talk about exactly what you wanted to talk about, but I would actually like to s go through a couple of those, uh, those aspects, the thermodynamic aspects and then some of the economic aspects. Oh, thank um, God. I can just say stupid jokes from time to time. Great. Go yeah, for it. So Let's the first thing I, I wanted to touch on is that you, uh, you kind of uh, give this view of energy expenditure and I just want to get your your thoughts on this on this assumption that you make early on in the paper, where you know you, you say that basically humanity has some sort of energy expenditure that they're going to. Uh, you, you kind of you kind of have like a, a model human, it seems like, with with a certain energy expenditure. And I just want to kind of play with the idea a little bit. And, you know, if, if I'm a 180 pound person sitting around doing white collar work all day, then I burn some amount of calories, right? If I'm an ultra runner and I'm going to go 100 miles in a day, I'm going to burn a different amount of calories. And so if we take the earth as the maximum size of humanity, right? Like, let's say every square inch of the earth is covered. Um, why, why wouldn't we limits the maximum growth differently since we're considering it a thermodynamic problem, right? So like if humanity has a maximum capacity of space on earth, then the input to keep it running is not really constrained. It's just, it's just depending on activity. Okay, sure. So I think that's a good, that's a good place to start. And that's actually kind of a good, maybe metaphor for complex systems in general is the idea of, if we imagine something like a biological organism. So in physics, there's sort of a precise definition of complexity, which is that a complex system, which could be something like the economy or the environment or, you know, a human being or other type of biological organism exhibits structure and exhibits behavior across a range of length scales and across a range of time scales. So going all the way from the microscopic all the way up to the macroscopic and everywhere in between you have different structures and you have different fundamental physics that are governing the description. So for example, in the human body, you would have cells that uh, make up tissues that make up organs that then make up the entire person and so on. Right. And most biological organisms, don't continue to grow and continue to get bigger throughout their lives. Essentially, they reach a state where they more or less are in an energy balance and their energy consumption is consistent. And because of the way the incentives are configured in the current economic system, there is no possibility for reaching that type of energy balance. And the reason is actually you can describe it in terms of game theory and i think a good place to uh i don't know if most of the listeners will be familiar with game theory or or not or maybe just from a i was gonna ask him um, yeah yeah a dumb guy flag on the field please sure. uh do a one or two sentence description of what game theory is because it is interesting stuff yeah of course um so the mathematician john nash is uh is famous for coming up with a lot of the game theory ideas. This was the guy in, played by, I think, Russell Crowe in A Beautiful That's Mind. That's right. The Beautiful um, Mind, dude. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the famous problem in game theory is the prisoner's dilemma, which is where you have two, two prisoners, you put them in separate rooms, and they can either declare the innocence or guilt of their partner. And depending on what both of the combined actions of both of them if they both say the other is innocent, if they both say the other is guilty, or one says innocent and one says guilty, they receive different different amounts of time in jail. They receive different penalties. And the idea is that it turns out the best option is for them both to declare the guilt of their partner, even though they would receive less prison time if they both cooperated, uh, because they're both acting as rational agents. And it turns out this is one of the the fundamental results of game theory that's counterintuitive but also very important is that depending on how the reward structure of the game is is put together it's possible for the best strategy of all of the participants not to lead to the best possible outcome 
And I'll say that again, because that's kind of important. It's possible that if everyone is acting rationally and pursuing their best strategy, you might not get the best possible outcome of the entire system. That you could have gotten, right. Yeah, and exactly. uh, to say it in even more broad general terms, uh, game theory is like the study of if you have a bunch of rational actors all trying to win something or get some outcome based on a set of rules and, uh, you know, what will they do? What will be the outcome? And then if you do it millions of times also, what are the trends and things we notice? And one of the ones that always gets me about this was that counterintuitive one about like, there's three doors and you can, and you pick from the first door and you're like, it's this amount of money. Do you want to pick again or not? And everything intuitive about it makes you say, it doesn't matter. It's a 50, 50 chance, but it's not true. The act of, t- of opening the door changes the chance. So now it's like 33 and a third. Anyway, there's game theory is very trippy. Actually, if you get into some of the interesting thought experiments. And I also wanted to underline that I do, th- I did find now analogies are slippery, right? Because, Ultimately, everything in existence is not any other thing. It is itself. Um, But I did find that the analogy of the human body really unlocked my understanding of this in a way. The idea that you grow physically, but if you grew continuously, you'd be some kind of Benjamin Button Godzilla monster, and we can't have that. So there's an equilibrium, right? And capitalism has seemingly, so far, no built-in mechanism and even I'm not even I should broaden the term capitalism because it's like industry or human technology, the rampant growth of our tool use and its side effects um, has no natural control on it yet of like, oh, we got to there has to be a release valve here. It's too hot. The engine needs air now. It's got to reach some kind of energy equilibrium. Um, and I what I like about the body analogy is also that even though you stop growing physically, your internal systems do not cease to develop. So it's like, this doesn't mean the stagnation of society, right? Is that fair to say? Uh, uh, That's absolutely true. And in fact, there's a trade-off between what might be considered to be physical growth and physical energy use versus the increasing richness or development of other features of the person that are related to their information entropy content. Things like you know, introspection, personal development, development of new skills, development of of, uh, other types of growth that aren't directly correlated to how how much energy a person uses. And there can be a trade-off between those two things, between the information entropy of a system and the energy expenditure of a system. And if the system is calibrated well, then at a certain point, it will start to emphasize information entropy over energy. And this, uh, the idea of game theory, it's actually very interesting because if you start looking for it, you can see it all over the place. There's this very famous example in political science called Duverger's Law, which says that if you have an election structure that's single vote, winner take all, in the same way that we do most of our elections in the United States, it will mathematically lead to a political system of two political parties that are more or less equally balanced. And that's exactly what we see. So even if you look at something like the political landscape, the effects of the the reason it's shaped the way it is, is because of the underlying mathematics of the game theory. One thing I want to say about the the game theory stuff, though, is um, in order for this. So I think there's definitely, you know, this is interesting. And I think that there's a lot of work on the specifics of this that or make it much more complex than a typical digital twin. Oh, by, by the way, the paper's about... But please explain digital twin and entropy inf- information. Entropy, please do that one too. Yeah. Um, yeah, do you want to describe... Well, f- first of all, l- let me just... Uh, the prisoner's dilemma thing is... Um, sure. In order for this to work, we have to assume that the agents are rational. And that is... V- that is a uh, stretch for humanity. Um, and so I think there's a lot of modification to those rules that not impossible, but something that needs to be considered much more uh, closely than, than just a simple uh, prisoner's dilemma or game theory. Uh, I mean, behavioral uh, psychology and behavioral economics in particular, I think would have a lot to say about setting setting people up as as machines or you know like the the prototypical or archetypal uh 
econ rational person rational yeah. actor rational so actor. yeah but i'm sure you'll want to say something about that but if you could define a digital twin and information uh actually, absolutely yeah. well and, and you're completely right and in fact swaim started to kind of touch on that idea in the description of evolution of a system over time so mm. the um there is a concept in game theory called the solution concept and the solution concept is the equilibrium strategy that will in general perform better than other strategies and if you have an evolutionary system the agents in the system will evolve toward what's called the solution concept over time only because those that evolve toward the solution concept end up uh, reaping more of the reward and this is more or less a process of evolution and natural selection but the solution concept that is the equilibrium condition over time the agents in the system will evolve toward that and in the case of a misconfigured system it could be that the equilibrium concept or the the equilibrium solution concept involves an increasing amount of energy will always yield a greater reward and that's the condition that we would want to avoid if we wanted to have something like an energy balance um and on the condition or on the the topic of digital twins digital twin is a it's a term that's been popularized in a lot of nasa projects over the last 10 years or so mm-hmm. and essentially the idea is that you have a digital representation of some uh, model that you're trying to design for example if you have a digital representation of an aircraft you want to be able to simulate it in as much detail as you can so that you don't have to do physical experiments because physical experiments are time consuming they are expensive mm-hmm. and you can only realistically do a handful of if you're doing let's say wind tunnel testing and you're measuring the properties of an aircraft you could only do a handful of wind tunnel tests per day but you could more realistically do hundreds or thousands of tests in that same amount of time if you had an accurate digital representation. But you want it to be close enough that it's valid, right? They have to yeah, be yeah, true experiments, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to wrap my head around this because, so like Northrop, or is it Northrop? No, no, Lockheed Martin and NVIDIA, I think just got a contract to do a digital twin of the earth for, uh, I think for Ooh. for climate science, I think it's just I for Musk it to live on. I think actually. Um, so it's a digital twin, and you you kind of use the aircraft as an analogy, but an aircraft is a system, and a digital twin of not just the Earth's climate, but also every agent uh, human on Earth is is a system of systems problem. Uh, that is just it's mind-boggling to me go there because there's we'll get there and i think it'll make sense um in a few minutes there are i think maybe two or three other puzzle pieces that once we put it together it'll sort of form the coherent picture and i think that it'll be uh, hopefully it'll become uh much more clear and uh come into focus a little bit more but there are like big ideas that are put into the world along these lines right like major steps forward in or you know the origins of game theory or the idea that it even applies or you know anything or cycle like in psychology the models that then become mood and become refined like i would say any large model that tries to explain some function of how we all together are in this and and how we function broadly isn't it always true that you can't model every detail and not everyone will. And the complexity is down to the nth degree. Like you might find a person who acts nothing like this because they have a different total chemistry in their brain. Isn't that, doesn't that critique apply to all, almost anything or like any hypothesis about that, humanity? That's really interesting. So that's called emergence. And this is a property of complex systems where you might through the, uh, the particular combination of individual elements in a system, you might produce behavior or produce an outcome that you don't expect and that you couldn't have predicted. And it's a property. And yet the hope is that your thing applies generally over time, like, right? I think the, the way to kind of, this is actually a good, 
a good time to talk about something called reinforcement learning because there's a direct applicability here in work that it, we could actually maybe use like a simple analogy to something like chemistry and it might make a little bit and then we could sort of extrapolate that concept to systems in general nice so, go man go yeah and uh i had this project that i was working on with um with some colleagues at purdue and mit and the university of connecticut where we were looking at using ai to generate uh synthetic replacement cartilage tissue for people who um have have cartilage damage because essentially once the cartilage matrix is broken down in the body it's pretty much gone there's essentially mm. no way to repair it and so a lot of people end up having to get total joint replacements and there are also astronauts who experience long-term exposure to radiation also experience breakdown of some of the soft tissue so we were looking at how can you create a polymer or a hydrogel that can function in the body similar to cartilage? And we started to look at this kind of from an ab initio perspective, ab initio being a Latin phrase that just means from the beginning, like from the very first principles. So we could imagine something like if we take individual atoms and we start to combine them in, in various ways, you could start to almost imagine like a chessboard or a go board and have, you know, you place one atom down, you place another atom down next to it, you place another atom next to that, and you can generate different combinations. And even for moderately sized organic molecules, you know, with maybe 30, 40, or 50 atoms, the number of possible combinations runs away towards 10 to the power 80, mm -hmm. which is more than the number of atoms in the universe, you know, so there, there needs to be a more intelligent way to do it. And you can even see analogies in AI learning to play things like, like chess or Go or other types of games like that where there are so many different possible games, you can't really simulate them all. So you have to find a way to intelligently decide what are the best moves, not knowing the possible future moves that might come down the line. And in, this is what reinforcement learning does. So reinforcement learning is where you have an actor who can make decisions based on the hypothetical long-term outcome of their, uh, they can take one step into the future, considering what effects that step might have very far down the line. And if we apply this to something like the design of an organic molecule, we can start to operate on the level of atoms and place one atom next to another, next to another. And once we see that okay, we have a combination that maybe has the properties that we want, we can start to pursue that a little bit more. And we can start to see, we can try a bunch of things and see what works. This is pretty similar to the process of human learning, actually. You try a lot of things and you see what the effects are and you see what works and what doesn't. And once you find some strategies that seem to work well, you can start to develop those and refine those over time. So you can start to develop organic combinations of atoms that are um that are exhibiting the exhibiting the properties that you want like high strength uh high lubricity high biocompatibility things like that and you move from the scale of individual atoms up to the scales of small groupings of monomers and then up to the scale of uh, polymer chains and then up to the scale of uh material microstructure and at each at each level you're performing a, an operation to find which combinations work and which combinations don't, and you represent them in the system as in object, uh, object-oriented computer programming, what you might call objects with particular properties. And uh, there's a trade-off in reinforcement learning. It's actually quite fundamental between, they call it the trade-off between exploration and exploitation. So exploration is when you try a lot of different things and you see what works. And then exploitation is when you find something that works well. And, and you, you forget to... all other things. Yeah, Who cares? exactly. I'll do this. Yeah. That's it. That's <laughs> it. And you have to refine those over time. Um, and you, you have to balance, balance the two. Do some amount of exploration, mm -hmm. some amount of exploitation. But the kind of the, the general idea is that as you scale up, you're no longer considering 
individual atoms at the atomic level when you're considering full polymer chains or considering full assemblies of a material that you might implant in the human body. So at the each scale, you're trying to minimize the amount of information that you need to represent the object. Um, and essentially, you're trying to minimize the amount of information entropy. And Griffin, I think you might have some familiarity here. When I talk about object-oriented programming, I would imagine that you have some idea or you have some familiarity with that, am I yeah. right? And for, for anyone who doesn't have a computer programming background, object-oriented programming is when you have in your program an object like, you know, you might write a simple Python program where you have an object that's a ball. And, you know, the object has properties like what type of ball? Okay, it's a basketball. It has a color property of being orange. And it has uh, methods like you could pass it or you could shoot it or something like this. And this concept of object-oriented programming is pretty useful, pretty well demonstrated in, um, in computer science. It's also very intuitive because this is a lot of what humans do naturally in our reasoning is to formulate things in terms of objects and the properties and affordances that those objects have. And in fact, you can find the ideal configuration of these objects by minimizing the amount of information that you need to represent them. And that's, that's that actually very fascinating. I feel like the minimum amount of information needed to represent what a human might do at any moment is still a lot, even though even the minimum would be quite a bit. Am I wrong in that? I don't think any. I don't think there's anyone successfully who has modeled that. Made it that strikes model me. Yet. It's like, very interesting yeah. that I would uh, survival video games like Minecraft, Valheim, et al., uh, which I play a lot with my cracked pals. Uh, of all the video game genres, in a sense, I, whatever we could talk about Sims or uh, flight simulators or whatever. But in some sense, it's a genre that's more closely trying to mimic life as it is than most. Because you have to gather resources to build, you learn new things, you put, you have to eat, you have to sleep, etc. Uh, and it's fascinating to me that the explore-exploit thing is exactly, that's the core game loop, right? You find a vein to mine, and you stick, out, you stick it out till you're bored, and then you go, well, I guess I'll explore for a while. Uh, and man, I can tack that all the way back to, I bet that's what primitive humans, what a, what a simple problem-solving heuristic is like. Oh, I found something that works. I'll do that for a while. Okay, my endorphin release from doing that is starting to become habituated and I'm losing my attraction to doing this. Um, I'll explore for new stimuli. Oh, now this works. I'll do this. <laughs> like, uh, man, in a way we're complex and in a way we're simple. Yeah, I think, I think you're completely right. It, it makes intuitive sense. And a lot of people who, when they get introduced to something like reinforcement learning for the first time, they immediately know, oh, okay, yeah. I see what's going on here. Very famously, within the last few years, there have been researchers who have, you know, trained games to or trained RL agents to play chess and to play Go, and also to uh, to play Atari games and discover new strategies for getting high scores in very bas basic mm -hmm. video games like that. But but Steve, those are simple games. Life <laughs> is a wicked game. There, Griffin, there's, there's no closed solution. You're low key coming out hard in this. <laughs> no, episode. I mean it's, it's an actual. <laughs> No, no, that that that's an actual term. So wait, wait, wait. Chris Isaac did not coin the term "wicked game." No, a "wicked game" is some is something unlike. Very disappointed. Chess. So it's like in child prodigies, they they're they're always taught to do these things that are, while complex, still like basically closed solutions. Um, and then uh, child prodigies usually have a difficult time excelling at wicked games, which are, which are things that have no actual solution to them. Like, like you said, you set like Bobby that. Fischer down and to play Galactic Imperium and he's not going to handle it that well. Sure. You lay out these steps, which I think are, well, super difficult, right? Like model-based or agent-based models for humanity and all of it, because you'd have to model basically every function of a human in order to get this model to be complete enough to actually tie it into Don't the forget regret and, and all that. <laughs> Don't put some nostalgia in there. Well, so my thing is, so you say the, the reward functions that you would be using for this are, they're, they're harmful optimizations with the, with the way that capitalism works, for instance, right now. But 
similar, or, you know, kind of separately, but in the same breath, we're talking about emergent phenomenon, right? And if we have a population of about 8 billion right now, it's kind of predicted that this is not, you know, what you talk about with this like runaway uh, energy expenditure, as far as humans, it's expected that that's not true, that at about 12 billion, uh, it is expected to, to <laughs> level out. That's and too so many. And so you'd have to either, yeah, right? So, so that's a lot, but you have, to, you have to say, okay, well, is the earth capable of sustaining 12 billion humans? Uh, it's, a, it's a stretch right now with our technology, but we've kind of figured out how to do things not well. I'm not saying we've solved our problems right now, but technology has helped us. Increase the amount of people who can live off the lesser resources, right? I mean, farming, yeah. for example, right? Like if you took a medieval farming, it would not be able to yeah. sustain 8 billion people. It seems to me that it could be that you think I'm saying that it's possible or necessary to somehow simulate or predict the activity of every single human being. And that's absolutely not what I'm saying. Well, yet. even an aggregate. And even an aggregate, you'd, you'd reduce them to, to some number of parameters. If we look at the way that the incentives are aligned right now, hypothetically, if somebody were to invent a device that scrubs CO2 from the atmosphere, that's not inherently a profitable thing to do. So there wouldn't necessarily be a huge incentive to do that, although that would be a very uh, helpful and beneficial thing for a lot of people. And the way that you could represent that is by, if you had something like a digital twin of the environment, and you were to simulate the effect of, if we reduce the effect of carbon dioxide or the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, how much would that affect the model of the environment? And you could quantify that in a precise way by measuring the information entropy content of the model of the digital twin. And the way that you, so that's, that's essentially what I mean by calibrating the incentives correctly. So I think in, a, in an ideal scenario, you're completely right that it, was, it would be more or less ideal to have everyone have the maximum possibility to pursue whatever is meaningful to, to him or her. And in, in any kind of control system or a control theory environment, you have to find a way to distribute the energy and distribute the resources within the system. And uh, for something like the let, let's let's think of a good example so in um i had an intern that i worked with named daniel shea who actually wrote a paper about he looked at a system of fluid flow and found that if you reduce the amount of information that you need to represent that in a in a digital twin it turns out that you automatically extract from it the different regimes of the fluid and you can automatically extract the where uh, where it's smooth laminar flow and where it's turbulent flow with a lot of eddies and vortices and things like that. So is regime a science word for the types of flow you perceive in a liquid as it moves through space? I'm gathering from context. <laughs> regime is is kind of like at what scale, which physical laws apply at which scale. So in something like, uh, at, at the atomic scale, in the atomic regime, you would have quantum me mechanics. Apply. Right, right. Okay, yeah, and then macro becomes Newtonian or whatever. Okay, understood. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. And for something like um, information entropy. Which we still okay, haven't defined. Yeah. <laughs> I, like, okay, yeah, let's talk about Maxwell's demon. Let's let's jump into that. But no, I... I is is that kind of roughly coming across, Griffin? That I don't think it's it's important to. In fact, oh, uh, the very first episode of Science or whatever, uh, you talked about Isaac Newton in quarantine. Do you remember that? Yes, yeah. <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> he he apparently had this extended sabbatical, and during his sabbatical, he came up with uh, the a lot of the basics of the theory of calculus. And it's really interesting there. If you look at a lot of the greatest scientists in, in history and a lot of the greatest scientific breakthroughs, they tend to occur when people have huge amounts of free time and lack of responsibility. And they're more or less 
free and unbounded to pursue whatever they, they want to pursue. And in the case of Newton, something like the creation of calculus would have been an emergent property. Nobody could have predicted that, but that was right. essentially enabled uh, in his case, because he had this kind of extended. So, first of all, I think we believe the same stuff. Mostly. Um, it's this, it, it's the presentation that, that the, that capitalism and a market economy is inherently, and I'm sure there are lots of people who are going to be like, boo Griffin, but is inherently the wrong choice based on these reward functions or or maybe a, a free market modified by something else is really what you're saying that we need to figure out. But we don't have perfect knowledge of consequences. And I think what we look for right now, and maybe this is the whole point, is that irrational or rational actors end up making irrationally harmful decisions based on short-term optimizations and we or lack of knowledge, full knowledge I mean, of the yeah, system. Yeah. So maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe from a, an objective standpoint, they're making irrational decisions, but with their imperfect knowledge, this they're is making what the wire decisions. is about. Yeah. No one, no one has the whole predictive model of Baltimore in their head. So even though they're all trying to do what's best, it doesn't work out. <laughs> right. But, and, and so we, so we're, 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 we're at a point now. So we have the, we have the, the the shit that we have now, right? We've already messed up the environment. It's causing problems actively currently. Um, and so you're talking about like creating the system that's self-contained, but the emergent properties of a free market and capitalism, if knowledge is more complete, may end up creating non-financial rewards that then have positive feedback into financial rewards and, and lead to things like, like fusion or, or better capture of solar power with uh, non-polymer based or non-oil based uh, solar cells and things like that. So, I mean, how can we reconcile that with not, not what you're saying, but with the way the papers kind of written with this, you you have it, it has like a, a little bit of an agenda to it that I think you're skipping a couple steps in the scientific process, and I'm saying this to you because you kind of asked for feedback because you haven't submitted it to journals yet. So that's my that's my feedback for you. Maybe I'm getting hung up on just language rather than actual uh, the scientific content of the paper. Yeah, of course that's that's no problem, and I'm I'm very interested in hearing what you have to say. I think that uh, you know my I definitely am only interested in being scientific and objective and not in any sense ideological. So I really have no no type of opinion or agenda and and uh, insofar as my main goal is to make the most accurate possible representation of the system to get the po best possible understanding of it. And I think it seems to me that uh, this would be a perfect place to talk about something. This is a perfect place to talk about uh, Maxwell Zeeman because the idea of, um, of a, a, a rational agent and the concept of rationality versus irrationality is definitely very applicable here. So on the concept of entropy and information entropy, the idea of entropy in a physical system is that it's a measure of the number of possible different states that the system can be in. So for, um, a good metaphor is order versus disorder and the fact that your house will get messier over time. And you can imagine that your house, you clean it, and then over time it gets more disordered and more messy, and then you have to go back and clean it up again. And uh, the reason is because there are more possible ways to be disordered. There are more possible ways for your house to be messy than there are for your house to be clean. So probabilistically, it evolves toward a state of disorder over time. And for something like a entropy of a physical system, they very often talk about it with ideal gases. So if you have a room with, let's say, hot air on one side and cold air on the other, they will 
combine and equilibrialize to a state of uh, you know room temperature. They will balance out and thermalize to the to a consistent temperature in the entire room because that's the state of the highest entropy. And in fact, the second law of thermodynamics is that entropy increases over time. So the concept of Maxwell's demon is this idea that if you have a room and you have uh, equal equal temperature air on both sides of the room and you have a dividing partition between the two and you have a demon that's operating the door between the two sides of the room can you have that demon and this is a hypothetical you know massless demon that has um it doesn't it's a perfect take any sphere energy to operate. Et cetera. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> it's uh yeah uh, uh, uh Approximate a human being as a perfect sphere of 100 <laughs> kilograms. Yeah. Like if, if you have, um, can the demon let hot air through one direction of the door and cold air through the other direction? And uh, in fact, reverse the second law of thermodynamics. Can the demon separate take them out? A, a room temperature room and split it into, yeah, a hot, hot air on one side and cold air on the other. And the idea is that actually you can't do it because there is a cost to the doing the calculation. There's the cost to doing the computation that offsets the amount of entropy that you save by doing the, by um, operating the door. And in the context of entropy being a reflection of the number of different possible states for information entropy, if you have uh, an eight bit, an eight bit integer, in your computer system that's represented by, you know, binary digits, there are going to be eight bits of entropy in that system because each bit can either be a zero or a one. So there are two to the power eight different possible states. And so the inform or the entropy of that system, it's called the Shannon entropy, is just eight bits of information. Does yeah, that make sense? Mostly. Did, does, incidentally, does that imply that a possible end state of the universe itself will be like a homogeneous soup where the entire space is the same density? <laughs> they some people yeah it, it's one i mean we, we actually don't know yeah yeah but that's the heat death of the universe right that's the that's heat the, death state that's okay. in the condition that the universe keeps expanding and we actually don't know if that's the case or if it will expand for a while and then contract but yeah if um my my understanding is that if it keeps expanding, then yeah, we end up in that thermal heat death state where entropy is just constant. This feels like a good time to pivot to my only real question, which is, um, let's assume for the sake of the next leg of the podcast that this is all correct and would totally work and save our asses and like save the world. Um, what's your take on the whole next step of like, how do you get people to then do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that uh, the very first thing to do is to produce kind of a very basic prototype. Of the digital twin itself, you mean? I'm working on a proposal to develop a software engine that's essentially a universal simulation and modeling engine. And the idea, when you had a uh, you had an interview with, um, remind me, on, um, on One Upsmanship, mm -hmm. You had an interview with uh, Charlie Cleveland. That's right, uh, creator of Subnautica. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And he he described how in this process, the way that you go about it is that you build a prototype, you test it, you learn something, uh, you build another prototype, you learn something else, and then you start to develop. Um, you start to develop momentum, and you start to get results that are you can put into something like a scientific paper, and you can publish them and things like that. And uh, that's the very first thing I think that that uh, we would want to do is to put together just a very basic prototype of a universal simulation and modeling engine that's based on this concept of minimization of complexity and information entropy, and then get some very basic results that could be published into uh, into a research paper. So my I have a, a nonprofit foundation called AI in Vivo that uh, is established for doing this type of work at the intersection of uh, artificial intelligence with scientific research. Hmm. And I'm working on proposals for, you know, the NIH and the NSF to do some of this work in terms of building a very basic kind of uh, software engine and doing simulation work and research work 
in ecology and uh, and economics in addition to some actual in vivo simulations. So things like uh, designing polymers to uh, perform as synthetic cartilage in the body, things like this. Right. Um, and I can definitely, I can always use collaborators and I, I can always use help with the coding. So if folks are listening to this and would be interested in collaborating on this, you can find more information at, uh, at AINVivo.org. Um, I also set up a Patreon page called AI in Vivo. And I think that would be the next step. Okay, great. Great. So we'll also link the paper itself, which we encourage you to check out. Um, as bewildering as I think some of the lingo of career scientists can be, um, the paper's actually highly digestible and understandable. So I would say if you're interested, definitely check it out. And we'll include that on the Patreon page in the episode notes. But yes, please, Steve, go ahead. I think that uh, uh, Griffin and I we're finding we're reaching kind of a point of understanding about the uh the maxwell's demon the main question i have is maxwell's demon you know obviously it's a it's it's a thought experiment it's, it's simplified but um it is based on the idea of a closed system and i'm not i, I mean how do you reconcile that with the earth which has you know a changing sun and potentially different uh a different number of organisms like plants that can help reabsorb co2 that we can't really predict at this point and you know just all of these all of these things, i mean the fact that some co2 does escape from the atmosphere it's not much but uh you know earth is not closed it's not a perfect marble that we can that we can just assume doesn't change at all so how, how do you work that into the model? There's this concept in complexity called Kolmogorov complexity. And Kolmogorov complexity is, it's the shortest length of a computer program that you could write that would produce a particular text as an output. So if I had a string of text that was Griffin or Rowell and Michael Swaim written over and over a thousand times. God. Then the shortest, the shortest program, oh yeah, the shortest program that would write that would actually just be a very small like for loop. You wouldn't need a lot, a lot of space to write that program, right? So the Kolmogorov complexity of that would actually be quite small. And the amount of information, the amount of complex information entropy in a system, is more of a reflection of how much information you need to do this type of representation to generate the. Um, the behavior of the system as accurately as possible. And there's a small group doing a lot of really interesting research on this at MIT. Um, there's a group at MIT uh, led by a guy named Max Tegmark, and they have done this work producing something called an AI physicist, which is very cool. They, um, they use the example of the tables that Kepler used of planetary motion in order to figure out the elliptical law of planetary orbits, which is kind of cool. And it's kind of easy to, to see where he's coming from because you might have these handwritten tables of thousands and thousands of measurements of the position of planets in the sky. And by looking at all of that, Kepler had to, you know, digest it and try to find an equation that could hypothetically reproduce all of those measurements. And from there, he was able to figure out the fact that the planets move in an ellipse and discovered that equation of planetary motion. And so if we take that concept of Kolmogorov complexity, we have a very small equation, you know, this elliptical equation that's only a few characters long, that can hypothetically generate all of the data that would have been in those, those tables of planetary motion. So you can reduce that model down to a very small amount of information entropy which I think is, is very interesting. And if you were to build that into a type of simulation engine, then you can find the most efficient representation of objects based on how much information and how much computational power it takes to represent them, uh, which is actually kind of cool. And it prevents something called overfitting. So if you have there are a lot of very big um, and very expensive and time consuming models that people can run for simulations of the climate and ocean currents and, and um, 
heat exchange and things like that, that if you extend them past the regime where they're built to operate, they tend not to perform very well. And it's because they're not particularly efficient in terms of the amount of the underlying equations contain a lot more information than they need to. And if you take something like an AI physicist approach, the goal is to find the minimum representation that gives you the maximum possible accuracy. And they also call that Pareto efficiency. So an equation is Pareto efficient if it gives you the best outputs uh, or the closest approximation of a data set for the minimum amount of information that it takes to represent. But to Griffin's point, and like if Newton invents physics on Thursday, do you have to update the model on Friday? I don't think so. I think... Or invents calculus, rather. You know what I mean? If there's an emergent, unpredictable event, do you go and change the model or does the equation stay the same? Yeah, I, I guess that is... My, Michael, that's kind of like... That's kind of my ultimate question is if... Fusion becomes commercialized next year, which we all know is not going to happen. But if, if that were to happen, then why is the incentive structure still miscalibrated? I, I think I see what you mean. Because okay. then you're relying on emergent yeah. properties to solve your problem, which seems less reliable of a solution than aggregate properties to, solve, to dig yourself out of the yes. hole. Yes. So, here, so here's my, my last point. Which is really just a. First of all, I think a real the gut idea punch. Is, with with this with this uh, I mean, with this proposal and and creating this engine is it sounds like it's a, of scientific value. So I don't want you to I don't want you to you or the listeners to take away that like the this idea is without merit because I think it's something that needs to be done. Um, but something I but something I do want to consider is. Ultimately, if this works, I mean, if you can make something that's compelling and, you know, has like a, a dashboard that Joe Biden can look at, right? Uh, there are policy implications to this kind of modeling. And there are a couple, there are a couple slippery parts of it at the, at the end that are a little bit scary to me. And one of those is when you talk about calibrating the model you know, to some sort of op optimum, some like Pareto optimum or something, uh, you have to determine what that optimal end state is and who's to say what that is. Have you ever heard of the repugnant conclusion in like ethical no. philosophy? No. So the repugnant conclusion is that for any perfectly equal population with very high positive welfare, there's a population with very low positive welfare, which is better, other things being equal. And it's this horrible thought experiment in ethical morality. Wait, how do you define better? That, or ethical philosophy. In that case? Um, so, it, it, so if I have 10 people on Earth who are all like Jeff Bezos, right? right? And they're all just like living it uh -huh. up. But I have a... And then, and then in a separate situation, I have a billion people on earth who are all medieval peasants or whatever, <laughs> medieval peasants who still have loving relationships and enjoy being alive. So basically any state where a being mm -hmm. would rather be alive than dead is a win for humanity is a, is a, is a utility win for humanity or whatever organism you're right. talking about. And so when, we're, when, we, when we are defining these conclusions as other humans, it scares me a little bit that first it will be approached from a very, uh, not just Western, but uh, you know, you're, you're a NASA scientist. You're like, you're doing all right financially, especially for the whole of humanity. You're probably in the top 1%, right? Um, and it's very easy to become disconnected from the repugnant conclusion in practice. And I, I'm, I'm wondering if you've thought about like what, what you set these conditions at as the end state. It's interesting to kind of talk about it. It's interesting to kind of find, um, to kind of clarify the idea, you know what I mean? And I think that uh, essentially the only, the only point that I'm making is that there's a miscalibration of incentives 
if there is no incentive for something like developing a technology for removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. That should be somehow incentivized but, if we ever want that to happen. That makes sense to me, yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's it. So a a system that's configured ideally. It sounds like Maxwell's demon, by the way, could probably handle it. Like, you know, sh- a little portal where the CO2 <laughs> you goes would, out. You would think and, so. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. you just you just throw the carbon dioxide into the yeah. portal and it's good. <laughs> Maybe we could have like a bunch of Maxwell's demons and they each get like one atom of carbon dioxide and remove also, it. Also, scientists are weird. There's no reason it needs to be a demon. Like, why is that? Why? Anyway, go on. <laughs> it's, it's technically demon. Oh, oh okay. As, as in, in an agent right. of... As in yeah. like the Greek, the Greek definition right. of demon, yeah. And um, so, no, essentially the, the only point is that, yeah, a, a system that's functioning correctly will do the right thing automatically and won't require too much manual adjusting of implementing the correct policies to get to prevent some type of disaster. And so the idea is that, oh, okay, if you have an ideal condition, if the game theoretic condition of, uh, of a system that doesn't take into account the interactions between fossil fuels and the environment, is that you end up with a runaway energy expenditure and a lot of damage done to the ecosystem, then it's better if you don't try to act as the Maxwell's demon and implement a bunch of policies to manually push back the damage that's being done to the environment. It's better to have the system incentivize that automatically. And that's kind of what I mean by the correct calibration. And all of that stuff about information entropy Essentially, all of that is to say, this is how you measure the effect. So if you want to figure out how much of an effect does a particular process have on the ecosystem, then what you do is you make a digital twin of it and you figure out how much that digital twin changes its information content if you enact some type of, if you release CO2 into it or something like that. So if you... But like testing the oh, airplane on the wind tunnel a thousand times. I mean, it's super interesting. Sure. And I'm just wondering, like, so you set up the incentive structure so that things are in balance. But in practice to humans, what does that look like? How do I make well, money off you know, this, Stephen Casey? No, I'm no, just kidding. No, 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 no. <laughs> no not, how, not how do you make no, money I, off yeah, of it, but what does life look like for humanity? Well, we don't know till we incentivize stuff and see what innovative solutions people come up with, right? No, but, but I'm saying it, it is a very real possibility that with current technology, with, without considering the potential emergent you know, improvements, which maybe you'd factor into the model to say, like, we really got to, like, fusion has to happen because, like, otherwise we're just screwed. There's no way around it. Like, if you, it, it, unless, you unless you make those, which I, I'm sure you would, um, you know, there's a, there's a real possibility that you say, like, okay, well, humanity needs to live this way be, in order to set up the incentive structure so that it's in balance. And what does that look like? Does that mean people don't? I don't. Yeah, I don't think it's saying that. But what if that's the answer? That's. Uh, I think that's exactly the opposite of of ideal. Um, I think that's. Uh, yeah, ideally, what we would want would would be from a, the perspective of something like control theory. We just need to have a way that of regulating the distribution of energy and resources in any system. And at the moment, the way that the economic system regulates energy and resources within the economic system and the incentives to that uh, don't take into account things like effects on the environment or effects on the well-being of individuals, more or less. And from the best sort of, um, actually, this is very interesting. From a control theory point of view, the ideal um, controller or the ideal uh, incentive structure of a system, of a, um, it's called a good regulator, of a system that regulates itself to be in a positive state, is that it contains an internal model of the system that acts, that's more or less as accurate as possible. But I think the idea is that, like, what we would like to do is simply set up a, a structure of incentives where it's possible for people to pursue what's meaningful for them for them to the maximum extent possible. So that's in it 
in most respects, not particularly rigid, you know, and the way that you would actually go about that, I think, is that you would have to do some tests and do some hypothetical experiments. If you had something like a universal uh, modeling and simulation engine, like the type that I'm describing, you could actually kind of build that out and see, well, huh, if we set the incentives like this, how does the system evolve? And if we set the incentives like that, how does the system evolve? And you can have information theoretic objects for the different components of the uh, the biosphere and the health of communities and the state of uh, technology and things like that and set the communication between those objects to be non-zero in such a way that you don't sort of um, it, you produce kind of an accurate representation of the system. I think or like at be... least try. Like right now, we're we're not know, even I, trying. I, we're yeah. just setting that parameter at zero and not thinking about it, and that's so inaccurate as to how the universe works. Yeah, and that's and that's totally like I will definitely say I I agree, and I I'm unsure that the in, the incentive structures that you're talking about, if you if you just look at culturally right now within our own country, we are going through a period of and and maybe this is. Maybe this is because the government is acting as Maxwell's demon is trying to, you know, depending on which government's in power uh, or administration is we're trying to step back from this level of inequality, understand that our history is still, you know, the scars of our history are still living with with people um, and and trying to treat people more equally and and just by doing that, just just by the fact of trying to t treat other people equally, there's this implicit loss of power and, like you say, the, the ability to pursue what's meaningful, or at least perceived, uh, uh, not, not actual, I think, um, from a group of people. And so I, I don't know that we have the level of knowledge of humanity that a model could capture what's happening with the earth and an agent based model no matter how simple you know no matter how low the information entropy it it could potentially show a positive result that would be built on civil war you know, or, or, or that would, that would involve, well, that would involve civil war and pave over it and show, Hey, this is the end result that we're going for. Right. It's good. It doesn't, it, it wouldn't matter that, that 10 million people are dead or something. And so no matter what we do, we are trying to impose a level of control on something that I, I think we can't, we could, we could probably come up with a model that in in the in at net is positive right like we can we can we can figure out the climate crisis um but i don't think a model can capture the things that i'm talking about and i i'm wondering if a model is by itself maybe and again this is just stuff to think about a model by itself is the answer or is it a model that then goes to inform economists and and social workers and all this to then take it and run in a policy direction right like i just the way that we're talking about it is, is it's like this this solution and i that that is that is scary to me <laughs> i guess imagine that we're just talking about a fitness function and we're talking about the in uh fitness function in reinforcement learning or in game theory is generally the, the thing that you're trying to optimize or the thing that you're trying to maximize. And you want your fitness function to reflect things like the quality in the environment. Um, and you want your fitness function to reflect things like uh, if you if you improve the environment, then the entire system, the fitness of the entire system uh, becomes more fit. And at the moment, the structure of money doesn't accurately represent the actual structure of fitness of the global climate. And because there's a mismatch between money as the reward structure and the fitness of the system, there's a, um, there's a dichotomy between 
where the model goes and the types of corrections that have to be applied to it. So essentially, that's the idea is to imagine that you're trying to move to a state of, uh, of greater fitness and not not in any way impose like absolute precise modeling or impose any kind of like rigid or top control down or, or something like that. controls through policy. I didn't get that from the paper either, <laughs> but... Well, that's a but. But what's the what's the result? Is my a better it, understanding of what's going on and incentivization of the underlying model that leads to unpredictable good outcomes, but incentivizes good outcomes over um, a misplaced outcome, which is let's just produce as much capital as possible as fast as we can. Griffin, you're killing me. I have I have perfect. a three hour Straight podcast oh, okay. I got to do right after that, so this so we'll have to leave it there. Um, Job's not on board. It's safe to say. Uh, I don't know. Any other stones you want to sling at our NASA scientists who very kindly came to <laughs> talk to us on our science no, pod? I, 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 the only reason I'm saying it is because this is a new idea. And I think these are questions that, I, I mean, on the research level, they, they aren't, they don't matter. Yeah. But if, if the idea is to produce something that shows how we can and i i I believe i believe that it's possible right like i i I don't think that the way our the way we measure gdp for instance is the best way to measure the wellness of a society um but there are economists who are working on that too and incorporating other other parameters and metrics that will help um so using a digital twin to do this I think is there's merit to it, uh, but consider consider the implications of it, and if it goes really well, like have this stuff have this stuff in mind because I can definitely I, see the like it's it's sparking things in you that I mean I I didn't expect you to say these things, and I see that oh, okay like this is stuff that could come to the surface that you know the idea is mostly to conduct research and to be academic and and. Um, <laughs> Try right, to just be objective, right? But yeah, I can definitely see. Also, that hot take to end on: sometimes civil wars are unavoidable. Oh, that's also just a factor of historical forces, and it may well be in our future. And there's not a lot that a digital twin model can do to stop that. Well, I would, I would say that that's probably what a digital twin model should be working to figure out. Because <laughs> how, how do we stop the civil war? Um, but yeah, so just last thing. Okay, the reason why it's bringing all this up is. We are living in a time period where, and I've spent my life on technology and science, but especially the way we use technology with people uh, has shown that we are extremely ignorant of how people react to different input and stimulus. And uh, I, I just want, I want us to make sure that even on an academic level, if it goes forward, then consider these things because we're not doing so we're not doing so great right now. <laughs> if I if I might just say, I mean, in, in no way am I like advocating for any type of social change or policy. All I'm doing is talking about conducting basic research of modeling and simulation. That's it. And I and I really wish you luck. This is super. It is a super interesting and uh, you know powerful idea. So. Um, I mean, I'll definitely be following along with you. Oh, can you say again the uh, the your your group? Uh, yeah, it's it's AIinvivo.org, and there's uh, a link to the Patreon page. You can send me a message on the website or at contacts at AIinvivo.org. And uh, and thanks a lot, guys. Thanks for having me on. This was thank fun. you, Stephen. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, Stephen Casey, Griffin Rowell, Griffosaurus on Twitter. I'm Swaim underscore Corp. I think that's all the info you need. You can get a bunch of bonus podcasts that uh, we do on the Small Beans Network over at patreon.com slash smallbeans, which is also where you'll find a link to Stephen's paper. And uh, you don't need to pay for that, by the way, because this is not a patron exclusive. So um, don't like head to the Patreon page anyway. Check this out. Read the paper. And then if you do throw us three bucks a month, you get... Exclusive podcasts like Star Trek The Next Futurama and Spiel Boys and stuff like that. Uh, I think that'll do it for this episode of Science or Whatever. Thank you for listening. We're going to blast off in a rocket of some kind.
This has been a Small Beans Endeavor. We're a bunch of pals who make podcasts, sketches, music, web series, and movies. The Beans always have new ideas percolating, so make sure to check us out at patreon.com slash smallbeans. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash smallbeans, where you can browse all of our current and past content, see what we've got planned in the future, and learn how your support can help the Small Beans grow into huge, giant monster beans. If you enjoyed this content module, please like, rate, subscribe, or tell a friend about us. We love you!